The Huawei Mate 50 Pro has already been around for a few months now, but it's finally made its way to the South African market. Not only is this the best flagship Huawei has ever produced, but it is the first Huawei that I've used for a while now that actually has a proper way of downloading, signing into, and using Google Apps. Being Huawei's top tier flagship, it of course costs quite a bit of money, but other than being able to use Google Apps, the Mate 50 Pro has a lot, and I mean a lot, going for it. There are obviously huge improvements over its predecessor since the Mate 40 series released over two years ago now, but this Mate 50 Pro certainly has what it takes to make other brands sweat. It currently sits right at the top of DxO mark thanks to its variable aperture main camera, impressive ultra wide and periscope sensors, not to mention its ability to record 4K 60fps video on all of its cameras, including its ultra wide selfie camera. Other than its impressive camera tech, the Mate 50 Pro has a vegan leather finish newly improved Kunlun glass, which is 10 times stronger than average, a six meter IP68 water certification, a larger battery, 3D face unlock, flagship Snapdragon chipset, all new EMUI 13 software, and more. All that said, can Huawei's latest flagship put its name back on the map to compete against the best that 2023 has to offer? Let's find out in my full review of the Huawei Mate 50 Pro. The Mate 50 Pro comes in three different color variants, namely orange, which is the version that I have, which is vegan leather. This is the only one that comes in 512 gigs of storage. You can also pick up a 256 gig of storage version in either black or silver, but they're both glass. We have this new metal ring with tiny pyramids wrapping around the camera module, which looks fantastic. And inside the phone sits a larger 4,700 milliamp hour battery, the same 66 watt wide charging, the same 50 watt wireless charging as its predecessor, a newly improved Snapdragon 8 Plus Gen 1 chipset, Adreno 730 integrated GPU, LPDDR5 RAM, UFS 3.1 storage, dual SIM 4G, unfortunately no 5G, Wi-Fi 6, Bluetooth 5.2 and NFC. The phone has a new protection over its display, that being Huawei's Kunlin glass, but strangely enough, this is only available on the orange vegan leather version. The back plate, of course, comes in either leather or glass, and the frames are a gold coated aluminum with a nice finish to match that of the camera module. The phone is 8.5 millimeters thick, whether you pick up the leather or glass variant, which is a hell of a lot thinner than its predecessor, and the leather version weighs in at just 205 grams and 209 grams for the glass variant. And when it comes to cameras, we have a 13 megapixel ultra wide sensor with 120 degrees field of view, a new and improved 64 megapixel OV 64B periscope camera, which can do 3.5 times optical zoom and has optical image stabilization. But the most impressive of the lot here is the 24 millimeter ultra aperture main camera, which is no doubt the 50 megapixel Sony IMX 766 sensor. It is unfortunately not a one inch sensor, which we've seen from recent flagships, but because of that variable aperture, which can range from 1.4 to 4.0 with 10 different aperture spots, makes it completely different to anything else I've seen around. Not to mention this device is literally at the top of the charts when it comes to DxO mark and for very good reason. Other than those incredible sensors, we also have a new X-Mage processing unit within the device, which produces some of the best images I have ever seen. Talking about X-Mage, we do have different filters that being bright, vivid, or original. On the ultra wide camera, it does a more than decent job if you ask me for 13 megapixels. We can also shoot it with the main camera, 12.5 megapixels spin down using the same filters. And we have an automatic aperture of f2.0 over here. And we can use the same filters with the periscope that being 60 megapixels, but it is worth mentioning that the periscope cannot shoot at native 64 megapixels. But it looks pretty good at original, so we're gonna stick to that. And speaking of that variable aperture, we have that aperture of f1.4, f2.0, Moving on to f2.8 and f4.0, you can see how the depth of field changes with it. We can do 10 different aperture spots in pro mode though. And going from f4.0 all the way to f1.4, taking a picture of me here, you can see that wonderful natural depth of field in the background as well as how it makes me truly pop. We also have portrait modes or using the main cam set to f1.4 in auto mode here. 1x, 2x or 3x and all of them look absolutely fantastic using the main camera. And we do have that wonderful macro mode, super macro mode, that is where you can get nice, close and personal using the ultra wide sensor and it does 
One of the best jobs I've ever seen a macro mode ever do. Now, of course, we have that 13 megapixel ultra wide over here. It looks phenomenal with these palm trees. We also have high res 50 megapixel mode for the main as well as binning that down using an auto aperture of f2.0. And of course, we can take a 16 megapixel periscope. This is binned down. You cannot shoot natively. We also have five times hybrid as well as 10 times hybrid zoom, which actually looks pretty much lossless. 30 times is where we start to lose a bit of detail. 50 times actually still looks bearable. And to be honest with you, all the way up to 100 times, it does a better job than any other 100 times zoom phone I've ever seen. We can shoot 4K 60 FPS video and we can switch between ultra wide main and the periscope camera at 4K 60 FPS, which is fantastic. Though there is a bit of a noticeable jump between each lens and shooting at 4K 60 FPS ultra wide, it is so silky smooth and layered with detail. It is absolutely insane, even though that sensor is just 13 megapixels and using 4K 60 FPS while literally running, as you can see my shadow over there, just shows how stable it truly is. Now we do have a stabilization mode known as steady shot. It caps at 1080p 60 FPS and it kind of crops in using the ultra wide sensor and it does a great job. 4K 60 FPS main video while running is still insanely stable without any stabilization mode. And unfortunately there's no 8K video option, but 4K 60 FPS on every single camera sensor is just something that you don't necessarily see in all phones. We do have 1080p 240 FPS slow motion video. This can go all the way up to 960 FPS. I took a video over here of this bird and it looks absolutely phenomenal at 240 FPS. Not to mention that we can also shoot 4K 60 FPS video of a subject with great natural depth in the background, no need for a portrait mode. And though there's no portrait mode per se, we can use the aperture mode on the camera UI and we can switch between different apertures while we're recording the same video at 1080p 24 FPS. And you can just see how the depth of field in the background adjusts, which is just mind boggling. Now, when you do the same thing at night from f4.0 all the way to f1.4, not only does it adjust the blur in the background, but it actually brightens up the sub a hell of a lot, something that I've never really seen with a smartphone before. This is truly DSLR quality. Now, of course, we can shoot 4K 30 FPS main video to get that natural depth in the background, which is a lot brighter than 4K 60 FPS main video when shooting at night. 4K 60 FPS still looks decently bright, but 30 is the sweet spot if you are recording at night. And shooting 4K 60 FPS video while walking around, things are a little bit more dim lit than I would have hoped. But of course, we do have that wonderful 4K 30 FPS video option, and it kind of of reverts to 24 FPS at night, even though that's not actually an option on the phone and it brightens things up substantially. Now we do have 4K 30 FPS ultra wide and while we are at 30 FPS ultra wide, the ultra wide camera is not good enough to actually show anything other than pretty much nothing, which is just black blur and 4K 60 FPS is even worse than that. So ultra wide camera in terms of video recording at night is not the best, but when it comes to taking photos at night with the ultra wide night mode off, night mode on doesn't make a huge difference, but it does pop in color and accuracy. And with night mode off with the main and night mode on, aperture is set to auto f1.4, it looks fantastic. Now night mode off with the periscope looks great, but night mode on reverts to the main sensor, it makes everything a bit fuzzy. Same thing can be said with five times hybrid zoom. As soon as we go to night mode on with five times times everything is wonky a bit again same thing with 10 times night mode off looks great night mode on brightens things up but loses a ton of detail because it's using the main camera same thing with 30x loses all the detail because of the main camera night mode off of you at 50 times and night mode on even deletes the text around that glowing light over there. Same thing for 70 times zoom all the way up to 100 times zoom. I would stick to night mode off in these scenarios since it does a better job with the periscope. Now when taking photos of me at night with an auto aperture of f1.4, with night mode on looks great. We have that aperture of f4.0, which doesn't look the best, but now you can truly see how the aperture and the variable aperture when you manually change it makes a difference at f1.4. It kind of deletes those lights, obstructions in the background. One times portrait, two times portrait, and three times portrait look absolutely phenomenal. Not the best, but they still do a great job considering that they're using the main camera. The camera setup on the Huawei Mate 50 Pro is probably my favorite camera setup on any smartphone to date. I had so much fun with this, more fun than I've ever had when testing out a smartphone in the last few years. The fact that you can actually adjust the aperture kind of makes you feel in control of the device like you're using a DSLR camera. I guess the one caveat about it is the fact that it can't necessarily take night mode photos when you use the periscope camera. But in my opinion, that's perfectly fine since it takes better photos than anything I've seen out there with night mode completely disabled. 
So that's actually a huge plus for this device. On the right side of the device, we have the power button above that, a non-split volume rocker. And at the bottom, we have a dual SIM 4G. Once again, I can't emphasize, unfortunately, not 5G, but is that such a big deal? We do have a nano memory SD card option as well as a water resistant seal. And we have USB 3.1 at the bottom, which doubles up as a display port. We do have dual stereo speakers, one at the bottom and one within the earpiece, which is noticeable completely. And we do have an IR blaster on top as well, which is a nice little touch. We do have that 18 millimeter ultra wide sensor that we saw within the Mate 40 Pro. It is 13 megapixels and sports the exact same top 3D sensor. The wide, as they call it within the camera UI looks great. 0.8X looks fantastic. 1X looks great as well. And we can do portrait mode, but only when set to 1X. And there's a bit of a workaround for it since you need to go into portrait mode. You need to tap on 1X, then you need to select effects, and then you need to click on something called circles in order to get that depth effect. What's up guys, this is Technic recording a 4K 60 FPS selfie video on the Huawei Mate 50 Pro, where you can seamlessly switch between wide 0.8x and 1x zoom levels using that ultra wide selfie cam let me know your thoughts on the video quality as well as the audio quality when recording with the selfie cam. The fact that you can actually change zoom levels with the selfie cam when recording at 4K 60 looks fantastic and 4K 30 and 4K 60 at night actually looks visible, which is really cool to see. 4K 30 at night obviously brightens things up a hell of a lot in terms of the subject and the background kind of just falls into a deep black, which I'm okay with since I actually look better than any other selfie video I've taken around. Taking a photo at night with the wide mode option, there's no night mode option for this, but there's flash on and off with 0.8X as well. And 1X we can do night mode on or off, flash on or off, and all of them look pretty fantastic. Even when we circle through in a different spot over here, my face looks okay, the background looks okay, the blur looks decent, there's a nice natural bokeh over there, but the details within my face only really truly come to light when we have the flash mode on when we're in portrait mode. So the selfie camera on this guy is largely unchanged from two years ago in the Mate 40 series, but that's not a big deal since it still takes class leading photos and videos and the fact that you can record 4K 60 FPS video and change the zoom levels while you're recording that 4K 60 FPS video on the fly makes this thing a vlogger's dream. Finally powering on the device, you'll notice that we have a wonderfully bright always on display, which is honestly always on and it interacts with the wallpaper. We do have an under display fingerprint sensor, which is indeed optical, not ultrasonic, unfortunately. And though it works really well and is very accurate, other smartphones from Huawei or Honor per se have a fingerprint sensor a lot higher up, which is a lot easier to reach. It's a bit weird that it's so low down. Though we do have that notch now and inside it obviously sits a top 3D sensor which we can use for biometrics such as 3D facial recognition. But in the past, why we have used a pull shaped notch in the Mate 40 series and now we have that notch at the top. Though it's a lot smaller, I guess the upside of it is that it does really well in terms of 3D facial recognition, probably the best I've seen around in terms of speed and accuracy. We do have a 6.74 inch OLED display. It is 19.5 by nine dual curved, and it is a notch display, whether you like that or not. It has one billion colors, it is 10 bits, and it supports HDR 10 plus content as well as wide vine L1 support, which is great. It has 1,750 nits of peak brightness and 1,000 nits on the whole surface area, which is great. And this time, we have 1440 hertz PWM dimming, which minimizes eye strain, a big jump up from its predecessor. And now we have a QHD to Full HD resolution with 428 PPI, which is great. And we have a 60 or 120 hertz refresh rate. Unfortunately, no LTPO tech this time around, but it is a bump up from the Mate 40 series, which had a 90 hertz panel. This has 120 hertz, and this has 300 hertz touch sampling rates as opposed to last time out, which was 240 hertz. We do have EMUI 13, which is kind of based on Android 12, I guess you could say. We do have HMS Core, that being Huawei, mobile services instead of Google mobile services, but you can get Google apps and you can sign into your accounts too, which is great. You can't sign in within the phone, but let me show you over here. So if you open up Google, it doesn't really work, but if you open up Google within something called Gbox, it does work. You can put the app on your home screen. It has a little preview screen of Gbox before going into the app, but it works and you can sign in as well. Now you can do the same with YouTube. You can either go into the Gbox app and then open up YouTube, or you can just have the icon on your home screen and go straight into it and it gets quicker the more that you use it. 
And the fact that it doesn't have a little badge at the bottom of the icon is great. Now the app gallery for Huawei actually allows you to see apps within Gbox or within APK websites such as APK Pure. You can download the APK Pure app and that works great too. Other than that, the app gallery from Huawei has all the other apps that you have come to know and love such as Facebook and Instagram. And we also have a separate game app which you can download all your favorite games from too, which is fantastic because it just separates your gaming from your everyday tasks that you have. And we even have something called Celia this time around, which is actually a voice assistant, not the best voice assistant I've seen around, but she even opens up Google Apps. Hey Celia, what's the weather like tomorrow? I expect partly sunny weather in four ways. Hey Celia, open Spotify. Okay. Hey Celia, open YouTube. Okay. Now speaking about the actual software, we once again have large folders, though this time you can change them into horizontal three or vertical three or three by three as a large folder. And you can tap directly on the app that you see in the folder and go straight into that app which is great. We've seen from many Android manufacturers these days. Now we have stackable widgets. So you can place widget cards on your home screen and you can add on top of them, like you can see over here, what I'm doing with layering three different widget cards on top of each other. You can rearrange them and you can swipe between them on your home screen. Something very different, something unique about this phone that you don't see on anything else and you can even put them together side by side. Now, of course, we also have multitasking gestures and when you're in an app, you can actually just swipe up to the top left for multitasking. And when you type on another app, it actually automatically adjusts them so that you have a bigger typing area. We can also move the app to the top right corner when in recents so that we can get to a floating window. We can then pin it to the side and we can go into multitasking from two different apps and then bring that floating window up so you can have three different apps on your screen at one time. The app drawer looks nice and sophisticated, I guess you could say. And we do have a notifications panel separated from the control center. You can switch between them on the fly as well. And it even picks up Spotify when you're in your music on the control panel. And we do have something called Super Device so you can connect to any of your Huawei devices seamlessly in the Huawei ecosystem. Not to mention we also have a ton of personalization options that many Android devices are doing these days. And haptics are great, not to mention that we can actually use Google Board this time around, which is fantastic. The haptics are up there with the best of the best. I mean, you wouldn't expect anything less since this is a flagship Huawei device and it even saves it to your little stacked widget on the side over there. We do have dual stereo speakers in the bottom and the earpiece, but how does it stack up to some of the best sounding smartphones around? Now, when it comes to gaming, we do have a game space overlay where you can open up mini windows as well as enable performance mode. Kickstarting things off with gaming with Genshin Impact over here, highest possible graphics, max FPS. We got an average FPS of 52, which is a little bit lower than the average Snapdragon 8 Plus Gen 1 chipset I've tested on my channel of 55, but a higher min and a slightly lower max, which is actually okay with me. This is a Huawei device with a Qualcomm chipset. Now we do have Call of Duty Mobile over here, low graphics in order to enable that ultra FPS mode. Now the game caps at 120 FPS, but we're getting a good stable 89 FPS. So it caps at 90 FPS and other Snapdragon 8 Plus Gen 1 phones, if they can hit 90 FPS, sit around the same FPS in terms of min and max and average. Now with Real Racing 3, it starts at 90 FPS, which is weird and then caps at 50. So it doesn't cap at 60, it caps at 50. I guess there isn't really much support for the game, but it still performs very stable and it feels silky smooth. I mean, it's a racing game, so you don't exactly need a very high frame rate, but it still does the job as you would expect a phone to do at this caliber. Now we do have eight gigs of LPDDR5 RAM, no RAM expansion over here, and it doesn't go higher than eight gigs. And we have that wonderful four nanometer run Snapdragon 8 Plus Gen 1 octa-core CPU. Unfortunately, it's only 4G, but we do have a high performance mode and using that high performance mode yielded an Intutu score of 1,047,290 points, which is slightly slightly lower than the average Snapdragon 8 Plus Gen 1 chipset, but a hell of a lot better than its predecessor. Now, when it comes to CPU, it was only slightly lower in terms of single core score as opposed to other Snapdragon 8 Plus Gen 1 phones out there, but it was actually quite a bit higher in terms of multi-core score. And moving on to the GPU side of things, testing out Wildlife Extreme, which renders at 4K, we got a score of 2777 
and an average FPS of 16.6, .6, which is actually higher than the average smartphone I've tested on my channel. The Huawei Mate 50 Pro is certainly no slouch when it comes to performance, thanks to that beefy Snapdragon 8 Plus Gen 1 CPU. And while it may lack 5G connectivity, as I've said so many times throughout this review, that's honestly its only drawback. It has incredible software with loads of customizations and the fact that it can actually run signed in Google apps is already a step in the right direction for the brand. But this device has so much more going for it other than just getting back on the map. It has one of the most breathtaking displays I have ever used, and while it lacks LTPO tech, it makes up for it with efficient software, a larger battery, and PWM dimming. It may have reintroduced the notch, but it's very small and makes up for it with an impressive selfie camera and top 3D sensor for 3D facial recognition. And speaking of cameras, its back camera setup is literally unmatched. This thing takes better photos and videos than I could have ever imagined possible. Let me know your thoughts on Huawei's latest Mate series flagship in the comment section down below. This is Tech Nick and I'll catch you in the next one.